morning. Welcome to the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. I'm Kim McClary, President and CEO, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to today's program. For those of you who are new to the Council Town Hall, we are a nonprofit with the mission of informing our members and audiences about the most compelling international, national, and regional issues. We are a nonpartisan organization, and a very important part of our program is that we enable our audiences to ask questions of our speakers to foster a more engaged discussion. We will be taking questions in about 30 minutes. There's a control panel on the right-hand side of your screen where you can type in your questions. Jessica Deganzik, our Vice President of Events, will be managing your questions during the Q&A portion of today's program, and she'll try, as always, to get to as many of your questions as possible. It's now my great pleasure to introduce today's program, Building National Security in an Unstable World, a conversation with former FBI Assistant Director Frank Figluzzi, moderated by Courtney Weinbaum, a Senior Management Specialist at RAND. Courtney, we're so appreciative of you moderating today's program. We have a very large audience. There's so much interest in this topic. So without further ado, let me turn this over to you and Mr. Figlusi. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, everyone else, and welcome to our event today. My name is Courtney Weinbaum. I am talking to you live from Washington, DC, where there is snow on the ground. I am a senior intelligence researcher at Rand Corporation. I have been working in the intelligence community for almost 20 years and I'm very excited to introduce and talk with our speaker today. Frank Figluzzi was an FBI special agent for 25 years. His most senior position in the FBI was as the head of the counterintelligence division. He is now an NBC News analyst, and he is here today to talk about his new book, The FBI Way. Before we begin, I want to take a moment to discuss um, tragic events that happened this week. This week was the most fatal week the FBI has had in over 10 years. Two FBI special agents, Laura Schwarzenberger and Daniel Alfin, were shot to death while serving a search warrant. The suspect is also dead and three other agents were wounded in the attack. Today during this program, we're gonna talk about topics that might seem abstract to some members of the audience or might even seem controversial. Things like cyber surveillance, counterintelligence missions, domestic terrorism. I'd like to take this moment to remember these two agents who for years were assigned exclusively to work on cases involving the exploitation of children. They died protecting children from the most heinous and evil crimes that happen in our country. Their work was not abstract, it was not controversial. And we owe their families, I believe, a debt of gratitude for their sacrifice. Um, Frank, before we get, um, get started with our regular program, is there anything you'd like to share about your thoughts and reactions from this week? So first, thank you for taking that moment, Courtney. This event was deeply personal for me because I had served five years in the Miami field office uh, as the assistant special agent in charge of that office. I know what the environment is like. I've also supervised a crimes against children squad during my career in San Francisco, and I understand the horrors of, of that work. So this served as a wake up call, I think, and a teachable moment for the public that the threat out there every day for the FBI is very real. The sacrifices sometimes include the ultimate sacrifice. And that's why I dedicated my book to the men and women of the FBI. Thank you, Frank. So your new book, The FBI Way, introduces us to what you call the seven C's. Um, would you like to take a moment and explain to us what this is? Sure. In, in a nutshell, Courtney, the book uh, it re represents something I thought I'd never do. I thought I'd be, never be that guy who writes the book about his career, but the moment uh, compelled me to do that. And that's because I was very concerned that the FBI's mission was being undermined by certain public perceptions that ha have developed <clears throat> over the course of the last four years. So here's the book in a nutshell. The FBI operates at an exceptionally high level of excellence when the stakes are the highest, when the stress is the strongest. I spent 25 years inside that organization, not only observing how they do that kind of values-based performance excellence, but also absorbing it and even leading it 
at times during my career from inside the internal affairs functions. And lastly, you don't need to spend 25 years inside the FBI to glean some of the leadership lessons that I've used. I distilled them down <clears throat> into what, as you said, I call the seven C's. And it starts with code, meaning all of us at a family, company, community, and even now country level need to understand what our core values are, what matters most, and develop our code of conduct around that. The FBI does that very well internally as it preserves what matters most to the nation. I move on through the seven C's and talk about the concept of conservancy, which is the very simple notion that preserving what matters most is a team sport. So if you lead a team of any kind, you want people rowing in the same direction and you want people understanding that it's not someone else's job to protect integrity, standards, compliance. It's everyone accountable, not only for themselves, but for the greater organization. The FBI is really good at that. And boy, I wish on January 6th, with the insurrection at the Capitol, that more Americans understood that they had to be conservators of what matters most for our democracy. I move on from there to clarity. You can't have a code or core values if nobody knows what they are. And so many times I walk into companies that post their mission and their core values on the wall and people walk by them every day and don't even know what they are. But it's time to take those down from the wall, dust them off, rethink them and articulate them clearly. So the rules of the road are, are there for everyone to see. I talk about consequences for those, that's the next C, for those who don't share the same code and values. And the nation is going through this discussion about consequences right now in the, in the terms of a Senate impeachment trial for a former president. I'm all about accountability and consequences, but the next chapter is called compassion. And you can't do consequences if you don't have compassion along with it. Nobody will buy into your core values or stay with you for very long if they see unfairness in how you do compliance, discipline, and leadership. Uh, from, from there, we move on to uh, the last two C's, which are credibility and consistency. Leaders have to have credibility, but in the book, I explain that the FBI is far from perfect. Credibility doesn't mean perfection. It means being passionate about getting it right. And then when you don't get it right, being very transparent and honest about the screw up and about what you're going to do to fix it. And I give real life war stories and examples some cleared for the very first time by the FBI in the book. And then lastly, I deliberately end with a chapter called Consistency, because consistency gives us hope for the future and a, and a roadmap on how to get through the highest level stress possible. So for example, I talk about my time as on-scene commander during the largest hazardous materials crime scene in the history of the FBI, the first anthrax murder in the United States in Boca Raton, Florida. We'd never done an anthrax environment search, a murder scene, hazmat environment. We could have panicked and said, "This, we, there must be some other way to do this that we don't know. We could have abandoned our core principles and training, but instead we said, this is a crime scene. This is a hazardous materials environment. We are trained for this, we can do it. The nation needs to do that right now with the stress that we're under. Cling to the values that got us here, the rule of law, the constitution, three equal branches of government, and we'll get through this, just as you can get through this in, when you're under high stress in your family or your company. Terrific, thank you so much, Frank. Um, let's keep talking for a moment about January 6th. You raised it, and I think you, you were reading my mind that it was something I wanted to talk about. Um, one of the questions that has been raised over the past weeks is the role of law enforcement that day. Um, there are records that several of the people who were arrested were members of law enforcement or active duty members of the military. Today, the Secretary of Defense called for a global stand down of all military units to talk about white supremacy in the military. Um, in law enforcement, how should the US be policing law enforcement to identify and root out white supremacy? What's the answer here? Yeah, this is a complex one, and, and it's it's ironic that we're asking questions about law enforcement and military on two levels, aren't we, with regard to the insurrection. We're first saying, you know, what happened with regard to law enforcement planning, response, military, National Guard, deployment or not? We need hard, we need to ask those hard questions and get 
truthful answers to those. And then on another level, as you mentioned, we're now saying, wait, wait a minute, there were participants, even leaders in this insurrection that looked like they came from the ranks of active duty and former law enforcement and military. So how did we get here and where do we go from here? First, let's not forget that this insurrection, this level of kind of radicalization and extremism didn't happen overnight. It's been developed for years. And in fact, you could say there are threads of this dating back you know, a century in our, in the, or more in the history of our nation. However, let's, let's look at some things. We've had a president for the last four years that cultivated people who had power and authority. We had multiple cops for Trump rallies uh, in the campaign posture of the Biden, excuse me, the, the Trump and Pence administration. We had one here a couple of times in, in the town I live in, highly attended by active duty law enforcement. We saw the Border Patrol Union at a Rose Garden ceremony where Trump accepted his nomination of his party, cheering in the, in the back of that Rose Garden crowd for their guy. These are active duty Border Patrol agents. So he cultivated this group, and it was a perfect storm, Courtney. The violence in, in the summer over uh, all of our cities, right? Black Lives Matter, excessive use of police protests, ex excessive use of police force protests, um, so-called Antifa ideologists, and then the criminal element that took over cities and committed violence and vandalism created a perfect storm of law enforcement thinking they were pariahs, they were being pressed more than ever before and, and hated, facing violence like, like we haven't seen since the 60s in the Vietnam War protests, a president who's cultivating them, I have your back, go ahead and do what you need to do, right? And we had this kind of recipe for radicalization. So how do we get through this? You mentioned that the secretary, new Secretary of Defense is doing a stand down. They're, they're gonna discuss and, and kind of set that core value, the, the code of conduct I talk about in the first chapter of my book. They're trying to reinstill that. Let me assure you that that's a good start, but it doesn't happen in one day of, of meetings with your sergeant. It's got to be woven through the fabric of the military from the Pentagon down to any deployed unit. And there has to be a zero tolerance policy that is emulated by every lieutenant, Captain, Major, Sergeant, General, everybody's got to row in that same direction and get on the same code or we're going to go sideways and it won't be pretty because the people going sideways will have guns and badges. Thank you. Um, let's stick with uh, January 6th for one more question and then we'll move on to, to a different topic. Um, for many of us who were watching at home on our couch, um, the security response appeared ill-prepared, Ill might be the word that I would use. Um, I'm curious what the word you would use would be. Um, was this an intelligence failure? You know, from a former counterintelligence um, special agent like yourself, were you watching an intelligence failure that day? So you're actually being very kind and understated um, in your description of what happened in terms of the posture that day. And, and I probably can't use the exact words um, since we're in a professional environment here of what I thought of the security planning and posture that day. Mm -hmm. We need hard answers and an independent, we need hard, hard questions answered and an in, truly independent commission. But here's what I saw on that day. I've been saying that that was not so much an intelligence failure, but rather a failure to act upon available intelligence because you and I sitting at home for about two weeks prior to the insurrection, if we were savvy enough, could have followed the planning for this uh, on social media in both public and private chat rooms of violent extremist groups and organizations. I even saw a discussion of, quote, how to overwhelm the Capitol Police. So, you know, there were even travel plans of buses stopping in various cities along up and down the East Coast in order to get everybody to, to D.C. So, was the intelligence there? You bet it was. Um, now, there are colleagues of mine at FBI who take issue with that and say, well, wait, wait a minute. How do you possibly monitor all of that? And how, and, and lawfully, by the way, and we need to get into this discussion. Um, and then how do you just, um, how do you differentiate between the aspirational, the guy sitting on his couch eating potato chips saying, boy, he wishes Nancy Pelosi were dead, and the guy who's going to actually act out and hurt somebody? And that is a daunting task that they're still trying to get their hands around. 
And with current tools and laws or lack thereof, it's virtually impossible. But here's what worries me the most about that day. We know that the FBI shared their intelligence concerns throughout the region, including with the Capitol Police. We even know that the Capitol Police Intelligence Unit prepared an extremely concerning uh, um, analysis to their hierarchy and said, we think bad things are going to be happening and we are going to be the target. And yet we saw a posture of some barricades and some cops in their usual daily patrol uniform. No, peri no real hard perimeter, no tactical teams on standby, nobody defending the inner perimeter of the Capitol. Even Secret Service showed up with their usual security detail for the vice president that day. No, no tactical teams for them either. I have a gut feeling that somebody much higher than the Capitol Police um, were, was intervening and, and we're gonna need answers on, on what that means. That's a terrifying thought. Thank you for sharing that with us. <laughs> um, many members of our audience today may hail from the tech sector. So let's talk about technologies. You've alluded to some of them already. Um, we can create a list of things like ubiquitous cameras and microphones, Internet of Things technologies, um, 5G as it's deployed nationwide, artificial intelligence, including applications like facial recognition and other applications. Uh, how do new emerging technologies affect the FBI's mission, either making it easier or more challenging to conduct investigations and vet sources? Um, and in your opinion, what is the right relationship between the FBI and the tech sector? Boy, there's a lot there. Um, and I want to get to that because I, uh, for, for three years in my FBI career, I supervised an FBI satellite office out of San Francisco Division located in Palo Alto. And it is the only it is the only FBI office dedicated entirely to counterintelligence work. And that is because of the extremely real valid threat that exists um, to research and intellectual property within Silicon Valley. So I want to get to that in a minute. But I don't think there could be in a more uh, street level example of the fact that technology is ahead of the intelligence community and more simple down to earth example of what we just talked about as you opened this talk. Those agents that died in, in uh, South Florida this week, they were observed through a ring camera on the subject's home. As they approached the house, the, the subject saw the FBI coming, got his automatic uh, assault weapon, and opened fire before they even knocked on the door. He took out five agents and killed two. Now, you may say, well, that's a, that's a very simple example, but, but it, it is a kind of metaphor for what the intelligence community and law enforcement is up against in terms of technology on a much grander scale. They got beat by technology that day, and they're going to change tactics uh, because of it. But on a much grander kind of Silicon Valley scale, we're nowhere near the point where artificial intelligence, um, 5G, and all the, the litany of things you went through is actually helping, not hurting law enforcement. We're not there yet. And boy, there are some tough things to wrestle with, like freedom, privacy, civil liberties, right? This is not easily resolved. The simple, you know, how many times have we seen in the news the issue of, hey, um, some firm refuses to give up a password or a passcode um, to allow the FBI to get into uh, a device uh, to stop either a terrorist attack or, and or solve a murder or investigate a murder. This is an ongoing discussion and, and, and even legislation is way behind on this and regulation on, on this. And the, the phrase going dark is still a hot phrase in the intelligence community, meaning we are blinded at times through encrypted apps and communications to our in our ability to secure the nation, and I understand this is a this is a debatable topic. We should be debating this. I am not someone who believes that the government should have the key to everything. A absolutely not. But I do think that we should be able to solve this, even on a on a very news topical level. Let's talk about what we're seeing today with regard to um, apps being taken down that support Parler, um, people being censored or suspended permanently from face, including the former president from Twitter and Facebook. Well, that's a two-edged sword, Courtney. Um, you know, you might say, well, Frank, I'm sure you're all for that. Well, I am and I'm not. I, I, I know what happened in international terrorism when we started taking comms and platforms down. 
we drove bad guys into the darker recesses of the web and the internet. They started right now, um, violent extremists domestically are migrating in droves to encrypted communications where they can't be seen. So we've got to talk through this in a very intelligent way. And it's got to, the discussion has got to be a partnership and collaboration with Silicon Valley. Great, thank you. Um, I want to follow up. I um, I think it's fascinating that you mentioned that the FBI's only field office dedicated to CI counterintelligence was in was in the heart of the tech sector. Um, two other arrests in the headlines that some of our audience members may be following. Um, two weeks ago, the Department of Justice arrested a senior professor at MIT University for grant fraud. Two years ago, the Department of Justice arrested a dean at Harvard similar charges, grant fraud. Um, can you put these cases in context for us and talk maybe about how the threat to the commercial tech sector might differ than the threat to the scientific university community and what's going on? Mm. Boy, we could do a whole hour on the threat from China particularly and, in, and specifically in some of the cases you're referring to what we know as the Thousand Talents Program. And um, I, I often, I wanna say this for, for many of your viewers who are, are maybe crossing their arms over their chest right now, feeling defensive about, about the notion that their research is threatened or the FBI feels like we can't trust the uh, researchers and, and uh, anyone within a company who, who has their own agenda. I, I did 25 years in the Bureau and learned a heck of a lot about the threat and countering it, but my eyes were additionally opened when I came out of that ivory tower of the government and then spent five years as a corporate security executive for a major international company that was at the time a Fortune 10 company with 300,000 employees in 180 nations. 20,000 of those employees were in China and a, re a sensitive research facility was in Shanghai. So when people look at me and say, here we go, there's an FBI knuckle dragger who thinks everybody's a threat, I want you to know that I've lived the life of, of the corporate world and the global world, and I understand the need to do business, and I understand what it's like, as I had to do, to protect an incredibly um, vibrant research community um, in a major American corporation. So one of the things I did in that major American corporation, I was the guy who actually instituted an insider threat program. I was the guy who actually was the one who sat down across the table from PhD engineers in the company when we discovered, or they reported, that they were engaged with the China Thousand Talents program. For, for those of your uh, viewers who don't know what China Thousand Talents is, it is, a, it is an attempt by, by the government of China to stop the brain drain to the West. Um, people come here and get great American degrees at the graduate level, but the cream of the crop who are in niche research areas, arcane even sounding research areas, those people are identified by China for targeting and, and, and recruitment. That assessment starts at the university level. And I, I know of arrests of professors who have been spotters and assessors in some of the worst case. Uh, pointing out to the Chinese government, this gal, this guy, he's a superstar. They're in an area of research that you're targeting. Let's track this person. And the money that's being offered by the Chinese government through the talents program is almost money you can't turn down. Easily six figures up front. Um, a, a professorship or assistant professorship, great housing back home, your parents are taken care of. And even then, Courtney, the folks I interviewed at, at the company that I worked for and, and said, hey, I've noticed that you've filled out an application or you've been approached um, by, by, the, by the program. Um, they look at me and go, I'm not leaving the United States. I love it here. I'm not going back. <laughs> or my wife doesn't want to go back or the kids don't want to go back. So the drain is happening. We've lost research there and uh, we've lost applications often that, that go to the Chinese military. Um, and I think I want to say this to the crowd. When, when this kind of counterintelligence is done wrong, it, it is ignorant. It, it, it sounds prejudicial and biased. Um, and it doesn't treat the scientists and engineers as equal partners um, and stewards of what they do. When it's done right, it is informed. It 
It provides defensible data to the research and intel and uh, and engineering and science community that shows them specifically your work that you worked on last week is being targeted for this reason, and the person you're dealing with is actually co-opted by the intelligence service. Here's the data. Here's the threat existential to your job and this company or this university project. And then the light bulb goes on. That was when I had the most success in the corporate security world was when I got people in a certain critical area of research. I showed them the applications. I showed them the targeting from the intelligence community showing that this technology and them personally. And then I started you know, asking for things like show of hands. How many people got this email that I have up on the slide behind me offering them $400 for consulting? Hands would go up. I got that email. Yeah, guess what? That's a front operation for a foreign intelligence service. So you've got, we, we have an obligation in the Intel community to, to get our act together and do our homework. But I think science, science and engineers need, scientists and engineers need to also understand they play a role in defending um, what could be an existential threat to what they do. So you're kind of describing, or if I'm reading between the lines, um, the need for maybe different different nuances of skill sets, you know, um, better outreach engagement and communication skills, for example. And one of my questions I was going to ask is what you think the FBI special agent of the future looks like? Um, what are the future skills special agents will need? Um, my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that all special agents go through the same training. So whether you're gonna be working in counterintelligence or counterterrorism, or more traditional areas of violent crime, there aren't specialized training skills. Should that be the case? Should that change? Yeah, so that's not entirely accurate. It, it, well, first of all, let's talk about the training. The training at, at Quantico, at the FBI Academy, for, for your initial training as an FBI agent and carrying that gun and badge is, of course, all basic training, but there is advanced training once you get into career paths. So if you're a cyber, or violent crime or counter intel. The best training I've ever had was counterintelligence, counter espionage training in the FBI later in my career. As I developed expertise, you get into extremely uh, nuanced language, cultural training, recruitment in place training, how to run a double agent operation. You, it, it's, it, there's clearly advanced training. In terms of what the FBI agent of the future looks like, I wanna say two things. Um, let's be careful not to overly focus on the special agent gun and badge position. Number one, because if we learned anything after 9-11 about connecting the dots, it's the intelligence analysts, the non-gun and badge folks who are now driving the programs. They're embedded in every single squad, in every single field office, and they are telling those agents, this is the priority. This is where you need to develop informants. Don't open that case, open this case. So. It's all about intelligence analysts, but as for agents, you need only look at what the current recruitment priorities are. When I came into the FBI, Courtney, um, I, I came out of law school. I, I was recruited a, as a lawyer. Um, you know, in the old days, it was accountants and lawyers, accountants and lawyers, follow the money, follow, okay. They, they couldn't care, I don't know if I get into the FBI today. They couldn't care less about, about my law degree. They, this is now the hard sciences, computer security, right? In military intelligence, critical needs languages, and I'm talking Pashto and Urdu and Farsi, right? Um, th this is these are savvy folks who can meet the needs. And I, in my career, I've I've worked with special agents who were dentists, um, pharmacists. You know, they were veterinarians, and all of that, chemists. All of that plays into what what the crime looks like today. And you know, how do you work a complex healthcare fraud case if you have no clue what healthcare fraud billing looks like or what cancer treatment looks like? It's, it's complex stuff, which is why today's FBI uh, recruits mostly have advanced degrees. Interesting, okay, I have to update my, uh, my, my experience or what I, what I thought. Um, you were in the Bureau during 9-11, after 9-11, you saw the creation of the Department of Homeland Security from the FBI. You saw the creation of the National Counterterrorism Center. Um, I'm curious, in your opinion, is the U.S. doing enough today to implement a homeland security strategy that merges national security, foreign intelligence, and domestic security? 
you know, where do we stand if you were giving us a report card and what do you think should happen? Okay, so the short answer to your question is no. I don't think enough's being done for an overall strategy. And I quite frankly and openly say that the creation of DHS after 9-11 was understandable, but it was a knee-jerk reaction. So we, as is very typically American, we uh, created a massive bureaucratic organization, threw a ton of money at it, and said, that's our answer to the 9-11 terrorist attacks. Um, so you've got, you know that DHS is a monster of a bureaucracy that has everything under its roof from Border Patrol to TSA to Secret Service to the United States Coast Guard. There, 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 you know, there's people who let people into the country and process citizenship applications somewhere in the government, and then there's somewhere people who stop them from getting into the country, and on and on and on. And many of these agencies were dragged kicking and screaming into this DHS organization. I don't see any benefit um, from having had it. And um, more, more importantly, if they had a nice national strategy, it would be, it would be helpful. Um, so what we really need right now is a plan to deal with the, what has been called by the FBI director repeatedly the number one threat to the country. So if you, if you look at the reaction to 9-11 and the, and the great story that we have not yet had a major act of terrorism on US soil since 9-11, international terrorism, um, it's not the story of DHS. I, I, and I hope I'm not offending anybody <laughs> at that organization. And if they have evidence to the contrary, I'd love for them to show it. But what it is, is a concerted effort by the government using law and investigative techniques to get inside the heads, and meaning the chat rooms, the websites, right, um, and, and prevent this from happening. So, uh, yeah, DHS, not a big fan. Um, DNI, let's talk about the DNI, who's supposed to be coordinating the intelligence plan for the government. Um, better success rate, but quite frankly, you know, how would you like to get the job of saying, hey, you've got about 16 or 20 intelligence agencies that you oversee the budget for, but you don't have any direct authority to tell them what to do, nor do you really establish their budget. Um, but you can suggest that they collect this intel and report this intel, and you can tell the White House about what they find. That's that's a recipe for disaster as well. That's that's not leadership. So so we've got to set people up for success. And and the DNI coming in now, uh, Avril, uh, she's incredible, uh, incredible professional. I'm, I'm excited about her entering the picture. But what I'd really like to advocate, Courtney, and I'm going to get up on my soapbox is, how about we, you know, we do what we have on the international side. We have an international terrorism law that makes it illegal and sends you to prison for 20 years to life if you commit an act of terrorism associated with an international cause. I find it fascinating that we have a definition on the books in the US Penal Code of domestic terrorism. It looks an awful light, lot like the definition to international terrorism, but guess what? We have no law against it. It's the only criminal program in the FBI where they can investigate you for it, but they can never charge you with it. There's no such law. And in fact, that's why you're seeing for the insurrectionists, you're seeing uh, initial arrests for things like trespass, theft of Nancy Pelosi's podium. What's that? And does that reflect the gravity of an insurrection? When you commit bank robbery, you get arrested not for trespassing in the bank, you get arrested for a serious federal crime called bank robbery. It's a crime against the federal government because they insure the money you stole. On January 6th, people tried to steal our democracy and we're arresting them for trespass? Let's get a law in place that allows us to have consequences that match the crime. Terrific, uh, terrific uh, argument. Um, I'm gonna ask uh, one more question and then I think we're gonna pivot to some audience questions from Jessica after that. Um, this one, I, I kind of like to get personal. I really wanna know what this was like for you. You were serving in the FBI at the time of Robert Hansen's arrest for spying for Russia. He was the most senior FBI official ever to be charged with espionage, as, as far as I know, you can correct us. Um, you describe him in your book. He obviously violated every one of your codes um, on a personal level. You know, what was it like when you learned about Robert Hansen? You know, what was that experience like for you? Well, first, it was personal because, as I describe in my book, Robert Hansen had been my boss, my unit chief for one year 
uh, as a, I was a young entry level supervisor at headquarters after I had left the field for my first promotion. And he was one of the strangest individuals uh, you could work for. And there have been movies and, and books written about him and, and psychological studies. I won't get into that. But um, I'll never forget the day many, many years after having worked for him when I was the num in the number two position at FBI Miami, driving to work on the Florida Turnpike and hearing on the radio that the FBI had arrested one of its own for espionage, Robert Philip Hansen. I had to pull the car over um, on the Florida Turnpike because I, I felt like I was getting punched in the gut. This was a betrayal, not only of the Bureau, but of the nation. And Bob Hansen is, is being held responsible for the deaths of at least 10 individuals who had offered to work for the United States government and betray their country, Russia. Um, and when he gave them up to Russia, they executed at least 10 people. So it's, it was a betrayal of monumental proportions. But here's the interesting thing. I decided to put that story in the book under the chapter called Credibility. And you might say, Frank, um, that's very strange. Why would you put a disaster in the chapter called Credibility? And that's because credibility is not about being perfect. It's about what you do when you screw up royally and how you fix it. So the FBI should never have allowed Bob Hansen to spy for 10 years for the FBI. He probably should never have been hired, quite frankly. But when, when there was clear indications that there was a mole in the US intelligence community, and boy, mole hunts are ugly and people get accused and investigated who might not have done it. But ultimately, when the FBI realized that the mole was theirs, it was inside FBI headquarters, they came down on him and arrested him and then made a public announcement and said, here's what we're going to do to fix the security gaps in our system that permitted a Bob Hansen to function for 10 years as a spy. Thank you. Thank you. There's there's uh, too many stories of Bob Hansen's in our intelligence community. Um, Jessica, have we gotten any questions in from the audience? Yes, we have. Thank you so much. Um, I will dive right into these because we have a lot. The first one, the FBI and its leadership has taken a bit of a beating over the past four years, including from those in Congress. What does the organization need to do to reassure the American public of its nonpartisan approach to law enforcement? Yeah, this is this is a, a seminal question for me because actually it's what helped prompt me to write the book. I couldn't take what I call the bureau bashing anymore, but I'm extremely candid in the book. I actually point out that the bureau is not blameless in this. Yes, we had a president who attacked the FBI every day because they were coming after him in the Russia inquiry. You you bet. But I point out that former director Jim Comey, who ultimately was fired by President Trump, he did not hold to those core values that I talk about in the book, which was accountability um, and consequences, thinking three steps ahead. Re remember the infamous press conference with the flags draped behind him, where Director Comey says no reasonable prosecutor would ever prosecute Hillary Clinton for the email case. Here's a problem. The FBI is not a prosecutive agency. It's an investigative agency. And the director doesn't make prosecutive decisions. He was a prosecutor for most of his career, including the Deputy Attorney General of the United States and the U.S. Attorney in Southern District of New York. He forgot that he was at an investigative agency. He doesn't make these calls, even if he doesn't trust the Attorney General. There's a bunch of lawyers across the street from headquarters who have to make those calls. And the second that he made that announcement and took over a highly charged political conclusion, he politicized the FBI in about half the minds of half the country. And then He's, he, he ruined it for the other half of the country when he later said, uh, we have to reopen the case because we, you know, we, we found new emails. And then on the eve of the election in 2016, he does another announcement. Never mind, we didn't find any new emails. Okay, so now the entire public is scratching their head saying, has the FBI become politicized? Is it partisan? I'm here to tell you it's not, but it allowed itself to be perceived that way, which is almost as worse, quite frankly. But listen, men and women in the FBI, in every field office, when they're around the, the, the water cooler in the office, here's what they talk about. How are the kids? What are you doing this weekend? How's your case going, right? Nobody's talking about how they voted or who they like. And then Peter Strzok, 
senior official at FBI in charge of the early Russia inquiry, he did engage in partisan emails and texts with a, his mistress, Lisa Page. And the minute those became public, I went on TV and said, you know what? He's got to go. He's going to get fired. And I, I, took, I caught hell on social media for that. Oh, my God, don't talk ill of anyone who's going after President Trump. No, I, I, that's the point. I don't care who's going after who. A senior FBI executive can't get political in his emails when he's running the biggest case in FBI history. And ultimately, Peter Strzok was fired as well. Thank you so much. This questioner says, in the mid-90s, two members of the white militia bombed the federal building in Oklahoma City. An anti-terrorism law was passed, but in it was the use of secret evidence that harmed the American Muslim community. How can you assure us that this bait and switch approach, at least in perception, will not happen again? Hmm. I don't know what the, um, what the questioner is referring to, because even after the Oklahoma City bombing in the 90s, we still don't have a domestic terrorism law. So I'd love to know what they're talking about. If you're talking about um, abuses that happened after 9-11 or abuses that can happen when we enact new laws in a knee-jerk fashion, that's a very valid concern. And so we, after, after the Patriot Act, and uh, when you may recall that the FBI and other sensitive agencies were collecting what was called metadata for phone records. It's really nothing more than your phone bill. They were, they were collecting your phone numbers that you dialed um, and the phone numbers that dialed you, pretty much what you'd see on your phone bill. But, but Congress understandably had real heartburn over that. It was a successful program. Um, you, you know, six months from now, if they get a terrorist phone number and they tell they look at their system and they go, wait, Frank Figaluzzi dialed that guy's number six months ago. Um, that's helpful. But Congress said, we, we, we're uncomfortable with this. Please stop. And um, they stopped. So I don't think that should preclude us from discussing whether we need a domestic terrorism law in place. Here's, here's the problem with, with abuses. you got to monitor this closely. Within the Muslim community, um, I've seen some pretty hellacious things happen with regard to sending people, developing informants inside mosques, routinely monitoring sermons in mosques. Um, and quite frankly, certain major city police departments who don't follow, don't have the rules that the FBI has to follow, they do some of these things and they've learned from abuses and exploitations as, as well. But the notion that we can't secure our nation and preserve civil liberties at the same time, I think is a fallacy. And I think it's it, it's a trap that causes us to stop talking about legislative solutions when instead we should be talking about how we monitor, constrain, report what we're doing so we mitigate the chance of abuses. This next questioner says, if Congress passes and the president signs legislation creating one or more federal domestic anti-terrorism laws, how substantially will the FBI need to expand its domestic intelligence undercover surveillance and CVE operations to support such laws with real teeth? That is a great question. I, I, but I, I, here's, I, I want to I make sure we're avoiding this trap again, because we need the law first. And talk of how many more resources will you need is a distraction right now, quite frankly. Um, the other thing that I see happening on the Hill right now is a lot of House and Senate members saying, Let's uh, let's give let's give a lot of money to the FBI to study this problem. Let's get some more resources. And here's what the FBI tells me. Uh, you know, we've got this problem. We we know it. We we told you twice last year, Congress, that it's the number one problem. We know exactly what's going on. And and you can throw money at it and talk about resources, but we got no law that helps us or gives us investigative techniques. So, you know, I right here's the deal. Right now. You have to wait for violence almost to happen before you can investigate something. And that doesn't cut it. And it's not how we do international terrorism. In international terrorism, because we have a law, we get in so much earlier in the process in a proactive preventive mode. We're in that chat room. We've got court ordered wiretaps on bad people talking about violent things. Look at the Walmart El Paso shooter, young white kid from Texas. He's in a chat room with like-minded people talking about the brown invaders and how he'd like to hurt the brown invaders, which is a, re a Trump reference to Mexicans, by the way. 
Well, I have I have ACLU friends who say, yeah, that's fine. Um, look, he's going to get executed in Texas. He, he he committed murder, mass murder at the Walmart. You don't need a law. And my my point is, no, you've just proved my point. He had to massacre people at the Walmart before the law kicked in, right? That's not how it works in international terrorism, where the, 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 the cops would have been in that chat room because he's chatting about violence. But right now, we have to wait for bad guys to come to the FBI and say, hey, I'm worried about my friend. The, the plot to kidnap uh, Governor Whitmer up in Michigan with the militia group, you know how that started? It started with a militia group member saying to law enforcement, hey, uh, these guys are scaring even me. They're talking about killing cops and kidnapping the governor. They're scaring me. But do we want a system that relies on the bad guys telling us they're scared? I think not. I want to ask a follow-up here, Jessica. I think this is an excellent question, and it's a topic that you know I'd love to spend an hour talking with Frank in my living room about this topic. Um, the the questioner who talked about being part of the Muslim community, I mean, has has identified some real fa fears that people have in this country. Um, we know that the FBI monitored Martin Luther King Jr. I mean, we're at the beginning of Black History Month. We know that our country does not have the best history of how we choose who we're going to surveil. Um, Frank, you brought up a great anecdote earlier in the hour where you said, how do I know that that guy sitting on his couch who says, I want to behead Nancy Pelosi, Pelosi, is it just talk or is he actually going to go out and try and behead Nancy Pelosi? What would the investigative line be? You know, is the FBI going to monitor every crazy uncle that we have out there? You know, how would they decide where to draw that line? Yeah, th this is a healthy discussion that we need to have, all of us need to have. Um, so the crazy uncle is is not of interest to the bureau until the crazy uncle starts talking about violence. So if the crazy uncle says, you know, I wish Nancy Pelosi were dead, eh, that's not gonna rise to the level of federal interest. Um, but if the crazy uncle says, me and, and Jim Bob have got some guns and we're looking at travel to DC, that's a different story. So the FBI has neither the lawful authority nor anywhere near the resources to want to look at every crazy uncle and their rantings. The question I have is, do we have the tools so that when that violent talk is, is happening, that we can get in there early enough to number, number one, see it or hear it happening? When someone reports their crazy uncle to us and says the magic words that violence is coming, do we really have all the tools we need? And if it happens and we can't stop it, are they going away for trespass or assault, or are they going away for domestic terrorism because they were trying to co use violence to coerce or intimidate the government or a civilian population because of a political ideology? It's a it's a it's a thin line, and the the, the word ideology is fraught with angst for people. No one wants to police ideology or thought. Absolutely not. But we need to link it to violence. And yes, you mentioned. You know, and yes, uh, we're in Black History Month. You mentioned the ex exploitations and abuses of J. Edgar Hoover, um, who thought he saw a threat with Martin, Martin Luther King. But let's be realistic. Um, maybe there was some evidence of, you know, that, that we still learn more about, about funding concerns, everything. But let, let's get to the bottom line. Martin Luther King was viewed as a threat by Hoover because there is a racist element in that thinking. And people who look different than us, it's the, are, are seen as more threatening. Look, look at the, the security posture in our nation over the summer with the Black Lives Matter movement and people, cops in riot gear and shooting rubber bullets and pepper bombs going off and a, a National Guard being deployed and talk of the president putting active duty boots on the ground. And then look at the intelligence that, that showed violence was gonna happen on January 6th and look at that response to a bunch of white folks who were going to protest and perhaps breach the, the Capitol. Very, very different. And you can't ignore that anymore. Well, and apologize to all crazy uncles. You guys do keep our holidays interesting. We're always curious what Christmas present we're gonna get from you. So stay weird guys, we love you. Um, <laughs> given that top tech talent can often make good money by going to the Googles of the world, what does the FBI do to entice top tech talent to their organization? Oh my, this is quite the challenge. Um, first, look, if this is about, I, I, tell, I talk to young people all the time because I tell the story in the FBI in my book. 
I, in my book, I say, I was an 11-year-old kid when I wrote a letter to the head of the FBI in, in uh, Connecticut, where I lived, and said, hey, I'm 11 years old, and I'd like to be an agent. And lo and behold, he actually wrote back, and it, it, it's astounding. So I take the time to talk to people who are interested, because somebody did for me. Now, if you're, here's what I tell young people. If you're doing this for the money, if you're, if, if you're interested, if you're signing up to public service for the money, have a nice day. You, you're making a huge mistake. Um, but I can tell them the story of lawyers and doctors and dentists and scientists uh, who all and corporate execs who all decide their careers are not what's making them happy. They're not finding the professional satisfaction and they want to protect the nation and do something meaningful and worthwhile with their lives. And they take a pay cut to come to the FBI and they don't turn back. When they do it, the FBI doesn't lose people. They, there's no, you know, there's a, the, the the minuscule number of people who go, ah, maybe I wasn't cut out for this, is is infinitesimal. People stay because of the reward that happens with that career. The computer skills are a challenge for everybody right now because they, you know, they become obsolete quickly, and there's constant updating of skill sets and training that the bureau is offering. That's another, that's another. Um, kind of carrot that's put out now that wasn't there when I was there, which is we now tell a recruit for a special agent that the career path we're thinking of for them. So the the cyber gal who's going, you know, I'm not sure I want to work narcotics for 10 years, right? She gets a letter now that says you are earmarked for the cyber career path as an agent. Um, that's pretty cool. And that's that's a direct result of the recruitment challenges. Thank you. What, in your opinion, in the present day, is the biggest threat to national security? Mm. Boy, this would have, if you asked me this uh, four or five years ago, my answer would have been entirely differently. different. The biggest threat to our national security is ourselves. It's domestic. It's the insider threat. Um, we've lost our resilience. We're not, I'm sorry to keep coming back to book references, but we're not all on the same code. We don't all have the same sense of conservancy. Um, we can't even figure out what consequences mean anymore. It's us. And uh, there are some really serious um, writers, uh, historians who are wondering aloud about the shelf life of a democracy like ours. So uh, it's us. We can beat back uh, the, the China wanting to dominate militarily, Russia wanting to hack everything and screw us up. And boy, do they. But bottom line is we've helped screw ourselves up too. Um, and we, we've we learned that we'll fall for just about anything if we don't stand for something. Um, so sadly, it's us. That's the threat moving forward. Well, that is a little stark, <laughs> but hopefully, hopefully these conversations and, and talking about it is going to get us uh, back on the right track. Someone asked, what is the difference between intelligence and counterintelligence? Hmm. There's a joke. <laughs> There's a joke in the counterintelligence community that um, when we see intelligence, we counter it. And so we, uh, but that's only for the insiders. Anybody that laughs at that is an insider. Uh, so look, counterintelligence is the effort to detect, deter, and defeat the work of foreign intelligence services operating against U.S. interests. It's spy catching. It's not spying. Intelligence work is the collection of actionable information that will aid the U.S. Counterintelligence is catching those who are collecting against us and working against the United States. Thank you so much. Um, this will be my final question, then, Courtney, I'll turn it back over to you. With regard to cybersecurity, counterintelligence, et cetera, what is the difference in responsibility among the CIA, NSA, and FBI? Right. Um, CIA is that collection agency. That's that they, they get they vacuum up information for a living that can assist the US in its mission and its national security. Um, and they target it. Um, and, and every year the intelligence community has shopping lists, intelligence collection lists that task every member of the intelligence community with this year's hot priority collection targets. They do it almost entirely overseas. And so that's the CIA remit. I'm oversimplifying, but but that's it. 
Um, NSA is a major part of the intelligence community and without getting into classified <laughs> discussions, they are highly technical and um, collect um, electronically um, against specific targets. They do it extremely well. I, 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 I wish we could tell the American so uh, the story of how good the NSA is, how much they've supported me in, in my career. Um, but, you know, when, when, you hear, when you hear people say, I, I, I'll give you an example. I, I'm not going to be able to, to attribute it directly to the NSA because I don't actually know. But if, for those who have ever read the first volume of the special counsel inquiry, Robert Mueller's report, uh, which is dedicated, that first volume is dedicated to the Russia collusion question, you know that the special counsel indicted uh, two dozen Russians for spying and hacking into the DNC and for social media propaganda. He indicted 12 actual GRU, Russian military intelligence officers, by name. And if you read the details of that, you see he names times, places, addresses, keystrokes at time of day in Russia when they did the hacking and how they did it. Uh, that's not coming from guessing. That's coming from a highly technical capability to collect on a very adverse target. Name, date, place, location, keystroke. That's astounding work. Um, and some of that work happens uh, at the NSA as well. The FBI, the FBI wears three hats now. It's a law enforcement agency that, with power of arrest. It's the counterintelligence agency of the US government catching spies. And it's also a part of the intelligence community and they do collect intelligence in the United States, you say, well, wait a minute, like like a mini CIA in the US? Yeah, there's there's not only a counterintelligence division in the FBI, which I headed, there's an intelligence division in the FBI that collects. And so I can tell you some astounding stories of collection inside the United States that aided the war fighter overseas. So imagine recruiting somebody in Minnesota that tells you that bad actor terrorist maybe his uncle, maybe his crazy uncle, is, is at this time and place, at the, you know, this location overseas, and the Pentagon goes, oh my God, he's one of the targeted ter top terrorists. That's an FBI source. We've collected intel. We've targeted a, a, a terrorist, hostile combatant. The Pentagon takes that guy out with a drone. That happens in the FBI. Well, thank you so much. This has been a very fascinating discussion, and I I hope when things open up, we can host you out here in Los Angeles. And Courtney, we can get you a little bit warmer than you're dealing with right now. So thank you so much. Thanks everybody for joining us. It was a great discussion. Absolutely. I have I have a whole list of questions we never got to, so it would be great to finish this another time. Um, thank you so much, Frank. Thank you to the Los Angeles World Affairs Council for hosting us. Um, Kim, I will uh, turn it over to you to wrap this up for today. This was such a terrific conversation. Thank you both for your expertise and your time. And Frank, thank you so much for your service. I think this was illuminating for all of our audiences. So thank you so very much. Thank As you. A thank, you. Thank, you for the opportunity. thank you. As a reminder to our audience, our live streams are being offered for free as a public service. Your generosity in providing donations also supports our live stream outreach to our public high school students. Our next high school program is on the Digital Learning Lab at the University of California at Irvine. It'll convene February 12th. So please help us keep these live streams going by texting the word give to the number on the screen. I also have a great update on our Bill Gates program on February 19th. He will be joined in conversation with climate change activists philanthropist and award-winning actor Don Cheadle. Next week, Politics in the Time of Coronavirus on Tuesday and on February 10th, LA's newest threat, COVID-19 mutations with top medical experts at Cedar sinai So please go to our website, lawacth.org, register for upcoming programs, become a member, make a donation. Please stay safe, stay informed, and we'll see you next Tuesday. Thank you all.